Hello and welcome to the 1 160th second photography podcast. Please don't forget to give us a review on iTunes. It would really help the podcast out because people would see good reviews. People aren't going to want to try a podcast where it doesn't have any reviews and you need to get a certain number on iTunes to even appear as being reviewed. So I know I would have had a few reviews but I need to get a few more reviews in order for it to say has reviews and, and to give a star rating. So if you wouldn't mind please just spend a little bit of time, quick moment, just to give a review and a star rating for the podcast. I'd really appreciate that. Thank you so much. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about something completely hypothetical. I'm going to be talking about what I would want if I had the ability to design my own camera. So we can all design our own camera. We can say we want this and that, but it's purely a theoretical exercise, just talking about what I would want in my perfect camera. So first of all, it would be mirrorless, and I would want it small. Now I have DSLRs, I have mirrorless, and I have compact cameras, and I'm finding more and more I'm picking up compact and smaller cameras rather than a DSLR or a mid-size mirrorless. I just prefer it, I just prefer photographing light. Of course, if I'm doing a certain shoot and it needs a DSLR, or it needs a macro lens, or it needs whatever, then I'll pick the tool best for the job. But if I'm just going out doing casual photography or some small YouTube videos, then nine times out of 10, going to pick the smallest camera that will do the job well and it's important that whatever you pick and whatever camera you use does the job well because anything can do the job but can it do the job well so picking your kit that does the job well is quite key so I'd want it mirrorless and I'd want it small and I'd want it waterproof and tough there are great benefits to having a tough camera and a waterproof camera I got hand cream on one of my cameras so I put some hand cream on and some of it got onto my camera and it wasn't a problem because it's a camera that's waterproof so I could just wash it off. Now obviously if it was a DSLR or something different it'd be a bit more of a problem but it just happened to be that it got onto a waterproof camera. So having cameras that are waterproof and tough and don't get scratched up easily that's what I'd want. I'm not bothered about the construction, I'm not bothered if it's all metal or it's plastic they both have benefits all metal is going to be tougher although plastic is tough it's going to be well built if it's all metal but if a camera is plastic it's likely to be lighter if a camera is metal it's likely to be heavier and it's likely to cost more as well so not bother what it's built from but i want it to be waterproof and tough i'd want two sd card slots as well the cards i prefer are standard size sd I'm not a fan of micro SD, they're too fiddly, I'm worried they're going to break. Equally, the more robust and tough ones are compact flash cards, but they're, they're too big really, and they're difficult to get now. So SD are nice and cheap, get a 64 gigabyte one for under £20, two SDs would be great. And the ability to customise what saves where, so one for RAW and a copy of a JPEG to another one so that if one failed you'd still have a backup, that would be good. One for video, one for stills, because this camera that I'm theoretically designing would be a hybrid camera, I'd use it for stills and video. I'd want tactile buttons. One thing I don't like about using my smartphone for photography is I have to use a screen and press things on a screen. I like buttons, I like an on switch, I like a shutter button, I like dials that I don't have to look at the camera or the device, I can do it from muscle memory essentially. I like one, I like cameras where we've got the aperture dial on, on the lens. On Canon cameras you have two sort of ways of doing aperture and shutter speed. On your more expensive Canon cameras you have two dials, one for aperture, one for shutter speed. On your lesser expensive Canon DSLRs you have a button that you press when you want to do aperture and you move the dial and if you move the dial without pressing it does the shutter speed. Really not the end of the world that system but having more dials and tactile functions is better particularly when it's cold and particularly when you're in a rush. And I'd have more buttons I've spoken about but I'd like them to be customizable so I can set them for different things for different modes. So in video It would be lovely if the buttons did different things to stills. It would also be really good if when I switch from stills to video, it remembered the previous setting. So if I'm shooting photography, I might be shooting at 1 200th of a second. I'm not going to be shooting video at that shutter speed. So if it's in video, 
it remembers 1 48th of a second shutter speed the last shutter speed I use and, if, and then when I go to stills it remembers my still one and then when I go back to video it still does 1 48th of a second shutter speed because it remembered it from last time. The camera should be able to run off and charge off USB and USB-C would be ideal. USB-C isn't really the be all and end all, everyone goes on about USB-C but equally I'm more than happy with micro USB. I've got so many micro USB cables lying about, probably got one in every room, just leave them lying about really. I've got more micro USB cables than I have USB-C. Only a couple of things I've got use USB-C, so everyone goes on about USB-C. Data transfer is faster on USB-C, but I'm unlikely to be transferring data if I can take my SD card out. I just want to be able to charge it, either in the camera while I'm using it or while I'm not using it. But I just want to have that option. Really, I quite like taking the battery out and charging it at a conventional charger rather than having to plug the camera in all the time. But I also want the option to be able to charge out in the field and out, out on the fly with USB. I have fairly small hands for a man and I never think grips are anything other than satisfactory. But it has to have a good grip. I can probably cope with pretty poor grips whereas some people can't. I don't ever feel I'm going to drop the camera even with badly gripped cameras but I'd want a decent grip I wouldn't want it flush I wouldn't want like a Sony RX100 where it's just completely flush and it's difficult to hold I'd want some form of grip and the sensor should be a full frame sensor because why not I'm designing my ultimate camera I don't think there's a huge deal of difference between full frame and APS-C in modern cameras now it's not like it used to be, but full frame does have better low light ability, so why not go for that? And speaking of sensors, one of the things I've noticed on the EOS R from watching review videos about it when it first came out is when you're changing the lens, the shutter closes to prevent dust from getting on your sensor. I'd like something like that, something to protect the sensor from dust because cleaning dust off a sensor is a hassle. And with a mirrorless camera, you're much more likely to get dust in your sensor than with a DSLR. I'd also want a stabilised sensor, in-body stabilisation. The sort of in-body stabilisation we see on Panasonic or Olympus cameras, really good six-stop image stabilisation for video work and for stills, but primarily I'll use it for video work. Thinking about lenses, I've given a clue away by talking about dust getting on the sensor. So when I first thought about doing this episode, I wondered whether would I want a interchangeable lens camera in my perfect camera, or would I want a compact that had a fixed lens? I like fixed lens cameras. They're simple, they don't get dust in. You can make do with the lens that's on it if it's wide enough. It's like a 35 millimeter or 28, it's fine. You need to go closer, you walk, and, and you zoom with your feet, as they say. If you have a camera that has a zoom range on it, but I suppose a bit like a bridge camera it's going to try and be a jack of all trades so really the compromise i suppose is to have this camera as an interchangeable lens camera however getting the best of both worlds the kit lens it comes with is a 28 millimeter f 2.8 pancake lens so the first time you get the camera out that's fitted on it and it's almost like it's a camera that isn't an interchangeable lens with a fixed lens because if that kit lens is good enough you could just get away with using that but you have the option of switching the lens out if you want. There's one camera company, I think it was Ricoh, did this really good idea, brought out this camera where you could change the sensor and attach to the sensor was like a lens. So the battery compartment and the screen stayed the same and you just switched like the lens bit and the sensor bit. I don't think that camera did particularly well, but it was a very good idea. Lens and the sensor were a module and you just change the module. Seems a very good idea. And speaking of changing the module, I'd want it be, to be designed in such a way that if an element broke, a home user, not a technician in a lab, not someone in a manufacturing plant, but the person who owned the camera could easily swap a part out. That would be brilliant. One time I dropped my iPhone and I cracked the screen and I decided I would change it myself. And it happened to be the iPhone 4S where the very last thing you need to take off is the screen. Other ones it's easier. I think the iPhone 4S was quite good for changing the battery, but changing the screen over was a hassle. And I did it. I ordered a part and I think it cost me £10 for the tools and the screen but it did take me nine hours to fix. It took me nine hours to replace it. It was a ridiculous length of time. 
And after that, because I, I broke it a couple of weeks later, after that, I just thought, for saving £20 for nine hours work, it's not worth it. So I'd want it to be modular in such a way that you can easily replace things. So if something breaks or gets damaged, you can switch it out. That would make the camera last longer. If I Imagine you could easily take it apart and replace broken things or even upgrade it. So a new sensor comes along, you can order that and you can put it in. Fantastic. I have put in um, focusing screens for DSLRs before and I've done very, very minor repairs and I've cleared dust out of a sensor. Like I said, I've replaced my iPhone screen and the next, speaking of the iPhone screen, the next time I broke it, I got someone else to do it and they did a dreadful job and I, I, I don't think I, I paid for it. It was such a bad job. You can actually see inside the iPhone. It was terrible. I learnt my lesson and then eventually I found someone who's really good and I stick with them now for all iPhone and iPad repairs. They're my go-to person. Once you find someone who's good at fixing these things, don't deviate. If they do a good job and they don't charge too much, stick with them because there are so many cowboys out there who are just dreadful at that. Anyway, I've digressed. So in terms of focusing, I'd want to be able to focus from the back of the screen and I want to be able to focus by the traditional method of holding it up to my eye. So I'd want an EVF and I would want a, a screen on the back, a touch screen, and I'd want an articulating screen, not one that flips up and flips down, but one that goes out to the side. The, those are the best ones. And because it's mirrorless, I'll be able to look through the EVF and I'll see what I'm shooting, not being fooled by what my eye can see optically. And I can touch to focus and all those things that you expect now with a mirrorless touchscreen. It should have excellent autofocus and it should have eye autofocus and really I'm sort of taking my inspiration from Canon's excellent autofocus system. That's what I would want. Flash. Flash was a tricky one. I did think about flash. I want a flash but I don't want a hot shoe but I want a cold shoe. To me the idea of a hot shoe seems outdated. I don't shoot with on-camera flash unless it's an emergency. If I have an external flash, it's never attached to the top of my camera. It's always off camera. Because if I'm going to use my own flash, I might as well use the pop-up one unless my camera doesn't have one. Rather than have a hot shoe to put a flash on, because I'm going to be working with off-camera flash and because I would use triggers, I'd actually want the triggers to be in the camera. So I would want the camera system to integrate with flashes and work on a wireless triggering system. And that can be done. I'm sure that's done at the moment. So that means it doesn't need a hot shoe. However, I'd want a cold shoe for putting microphones and other attachments on because they're all designed to go in the hot shoe. So it, it could have a hot shoe, it could not have a hot shoe. I don't need a hot shoe because I would want it to work wirelessly. It would have built-in triggers that would wirelessly via radio waves communicate with flashes and trigger off-camera flash that way. I'd also want a small flash built in, maybe a pop-up flash. Nothing fancy, more like a Sony one that just pops up to the side and you can angle it up and down. You can point at the scene of a bounce flash rather than a DSLR pop-up flash where you can't angle it. So that's what I'd want for flash. The modes I would want, I could live without an auto mode. There are some cameras where I use auto mode because it's very handy. But for this camera, particularly because I've designed it myself, I don't think I'd want auto mode, I wouldn't want panorama mode, any of that, I'd want serious modes. I would want a manual mode, obviously, I'd want aperture priority, I'd want shutter priority, and I'd probably want a memory recall mode, where you set your values in manual, and then you save it to a preset, and then that's a mode you access. I would want it to have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but not the standard offering. Really what I'd want is a very, very good app that integrates with it. So I'd want to be able to do a shoot and I'd want small previews to be wirelessly sent to my iPad or my iPhone. That's what I'd want. I'd want true wireless tethered shooting. And I suppose that is a complete oxymoron because tethered means attached and wireless means not attached by a wire. It is an oxymoron and I can't believe I've said that, but that's what I'd want. I want previews to be able to be picked up on a smart device. We would have to be sending small previews. We couldn't send 20 megapixel files or raw files. It would need to be small JPEGs really, but that's all you need just to give out previews on a screen. That'd be really useful. I've talked about photography and for video, 
I'd want it to be very good at video as well. I'd want it to do frame rates from 24 frames per second to 60 frames per second, going in 25, 30, 50, and 60. And I wouldn't want to have to switch from PAL to NTSC. I just want those frame rates available without having to switch. And I'd want those in 1080, 4K, and 2.7K, because I think 2.7K everyone has completely glossed over. 4K is great, and I have cameras that shoot in 4K, but I very rarely use it. I can edit 4K files quite easily on my iPad. It copes with it remarkably well. And I can edit 4K on my desktop and my laptop, but I have to use proxy files. And of course I can edit 4K on Wii Video, which I use quite a lot as well. Problem with editing 4K on Wii Video is it takes a long time to upload, and it just takes a long time with anything in 4K. So I tend not to shoot at 4K, I tend to output my videos at 1080, because don't forget I've got to upload them to YouTube at some point, unless I'm doing it in Wii Video, because I can easily sync what's on Wii Video server with YouTube server very easily, but I have to get the files up there and it takes time, particularly in 4K. So 2.7K is a bit of a missing link. No one goes on about 2.7K, but it's higher than 1080 and it's not as cumbersome as 4K. And I think 2.7K is really good. If I do shoot anything above HD, I've shot 2.7K and then I've exported it at HD and it's given a lovely image, a lovely crisp export. So I'd want it to do 2.7K. If I ever shoot with GoPro, that's what I'm filming on 2.7K. And most people think I filmed in 4K. They just can't tell the difference when I export a 1080. The 2.7K is better than the 1080 on GoPro as well. I'd also want a mic jack 3.5mm, nothing else. And I'd want a 3.5mm headphone jack as well. So I can just monitor my audio. The software it uses should have audio levels. It should have focus peaking, zebras false colours a histogram for both video and photography and a waveform and all those fancy displays should be built in. I'm not bothered about using an external monitor and recording 10 bit 422 because I don't even know what that is. So why would I want to record it? So I just need 1080, 2.7 and who knows in the future I might need 4K. So those are the things I'd want. I'd want it to be open to third party support. So I'd want other manufacturers other than my pristine camera manufacturing theoretical company to be able to make things for it. So I want third party support in terms of flashes, lenses, batteries, and all those other peripherals that you need for your cameras. Oh, and the last thing, which is the killer item really, is I'd want it to be well priced. This camera that I've designed sounds like it would sell for £3,000. Well, I wouldn't buy it if it cost that much, even if it was designed by me. It's too much. So I'd want it to be well-priced. And again, that makes it difficult because there's obviously going to be compromises there. I'm building the ultimate thing. And I will say, and I've said so many times, there's no such thing as the perfect camera because every camera comes with compromises. If it does all these things, it costs a lot of money. If it's well-built... It might be heavy. If it's an interchangeable lens camera that's a full frame, it might be big. If it's a small interchangeable lens camera, it'll have a small sensor and it won't be good at low light. You'll never get the perfect camera. But maybe I've described something as close to the perfect camera as you can get. So I hope you've liked the episode. It was a bit of an odd one, but hopefully you've gained something from it and it's been maybe thought provoking. Thank you. Goodbye.